Earlier this week, we discussed eight players on offense that have something to prove this season. Now we turn to the defense. I don't have as many players to go over, but I am going to tell you why Jonathan Allen may be one of the best players on defense, but he also has the most to prove this coming season. That and more on today's episode of Locks on Commanders. You are Locked On Commanders, your daily podcast on the Washington Commanders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome into today's episode of Locked On Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This is your daily podcast covering the Washington Commanders. And don't forget that you can subscribe for free on YouTube or wherever you're listening to this podcast. I'm your host, David Harrison, credential member of the media covering the Washington Commanders for CommanderGameDay.com, a part of Sports Illustrated. And I'm here with you every Monday through Friday, greatly appreciating you coming through today and every day. Appreciating you coming through every single day on today's episode. We're going to dive into defensive players that have something they need to prove this coming season, following up on our offensive version of this same episode earlier in the week. And it's all going to start with one of the team captains, Jonathan Allen. But if you want to discuss this episode further or anything else going on with the Washington Commanders, head over to joinsubtext.com slash locks on commanders. Sign up to be an insider today. And from there, you can text me. I can text you. We can talk about analysis, episodes, content, everything delivered directly to your phone. No hashtags, no apps, no filters, just you and me texting back and forth, talking ball, man. That's what we love to do. In fact, Talk ball a little bit with Logan Paulson, team analyst for the Washington Commanders on yesterday's episode. If you haven't had any opportunity to check that out yet, we talked about a lot of things in a short period, in a relatively short period of time. Always great talking to Logan. So, you know, I had to get as much out of him as I could while he was here. So shout out to everybody who's already seen or heard that episode, but head over there or uh, head back after you listen to this episode as well, if you want to catch that uh, as well. Leading off my list of the Washington Commanders defenders with something to prove this season is team captain, defensive tackle, Jonathan Allen. Now, who has the most to prove on defense this season is up to debate as much as who actually has something to prove is, right? We all measure how much someone needs to show in our own way. So this is my way of gauging who needs to prove and what they need to prove, right? They're not all going to be on the list for the same reasons. And I want to be clear that simply being on this list, even though we say when you hear they have something to prove, I think the the natural reaction is to think like, oh, they have a shortcoming or they have, you know, a deficiency that they need to fix. Being on this list alone is not necessarily a negative in and of itself. And and really it's kind of in the eye of the beholder. And when we talk about Jonathan Allen, for example, in seven NFL seasons now, he's been a team captain in Washington five times. He's made the Pro Bowl two out of the last three seasons. He started 15 or more games every single year since 2018, finishing with no fewer than 61 tackles and five and a half sacks in all but one season in each of those categories. Until last season, his run defense grades have always been in the mid to good levels, uh, according to PFF grading systems. His pass pass rush grades have always been solid. Greens and blues every year, except for 2019, which for those of you not familiar with PFF, green is good, blue is better in their grading color schemes, right? And then you've got orange and yellows and and red, obviously, is, is in the bad. I think that's a universal color for bad uh, when we talk about rating things. Total defensive grades, he's only finished under 60 once in his entire career. He's finished over 78 more years than he's finished under 78. So in a lot of ways, if you came to me and said, bro, Jonathan Allen's got nothing to prove on the field, I would probably agree with you. And in a lot of ways, he's certainly proven that he's one of the best, one of the most consistent in the league, especially in this franchise's history. But I think that mentality of not having anything to prove kind of got the best of Jonathan Allen last year. And that is why, to me, he's got a lot to prove this year. Last year, John made a lot of things going on with this team about himself. We all saw the team struggling. And for the most part, most of us laid the blame for those struggles at the feet of the Washington Commanders coaching staff, especially Ron Rivera, who's also the roster decision maker. We talk about signing, re-signing, trading, not trading, drafting, all that stuff, right? So a lot of blame was put at the feet of the coaching staff. But then came the comments from John Allen as the season started slipping away, and then especially once it was kind of out of hand, comments of frustration and a lot of focus on his own self, his own experiences. Those were at the center of some of his comments. And in in the ultimate team sport environment, when you're supposed to be a franchise leader, any kind of me talk is very, very dangerous. 
especially when it's negative me talk, because people around you, fans, media, you know, everybody else, national media, especially, they're already kind of looking for reasons to be like, oh, everything's coming apart at the seams. Like it's, it's never really good enough for a team to just be losing, right? Like whenever a team starts losing, it's almost like vultures looking for a carcass. Everybody's always looking for a reason, not only to say, yes, you're losing. And yes, you know, the, the, the team is struggling, but everybody wants to know why you're struggling. And it's not just about the X's and O's. Who doesn't like each other? Who doesn't want to work with each other? Who's got a bad attitude? All of these things, right? So in the ultimate team sport, the more me talk you have, especially when things are not going well, the more dangerous it is. Flat out telling the public that you've considered what it would be like to be elsewhere and not play for this team is PR suicide. Because from there, there's really only three groups of reactions that people are going to have. You are going to have the group that's kind of in the you think you're better than everyone group, the group that's in the you think this organization is beneath you, which is somewhat similar, but slightly different. Or I don't blame you. You're going to have people who say, bro, look at what John Allen's been through since he's been in the NFL with this franchise. Can you blame him for being frustrated? Only one of those reactions, though, is positive. It's the group that says, I don't blame you. But the people who think you think you're better than everybody or you just don't think this organization is good enough for you, which, again, kind of the same thing, but pulling from different directions, right? Only one of those responses is really positive. And even that positive response is encouraging you to be an isolated player in the ultimate team sport. So even that is not necessarily a positive because you're now making yourself not part of the problem, but also not part of the solution. And when you're not part of the problem or the solution in any organization, you're nothing. You cease to exist in the process. And that is the worst place to be, to be quite honest with you, because at least if you're part of the problem, you can work towards becoming part of the solution. But if you're nothing, if you are just detached, that is a bad place to be. So it's no surprise that after some of those comments and as the comments continue to come out, really it's only two or three times, right? But as they continue to come out, a lot of people started calling for Jonathan Allen to be traded either at the time before the trade deadline or during the off season. And since the end of the season, they've called for it. And honestly, there's even still people who want to see Jonathan Allen get traded, even though now he's kind of starting to say some of the right things. So because, again, being part of the problem, disconnected from the problem or part of the solution, only three parts of a situation you can be. Any situation, you can only be one of those three parts. Two of them are bad. Only one of them is good. Allen is beyond the point in his career where he can be disinterested or part of the problem. So the only choice he has is be part of the solution. So far, and it's only been one OTA podium session, he's saying the right things. And his presence during voluntary portions of the offseason is not a surprise because that's part of the consistent professionalism that John Allen has shown his entire career, but he still deserves credit for it. So I want to make sure that just because it's the norm for him doesn't mean he doesn't deserve credit for it. It's a step in the right direction because I promise you, as the leaders that are taking over this struggling roster are, are evaluating everything, this coaching staff is keeping an eye. They're aware of what John Allen said. They're aware of what that can do to their team, what that can do to their locker room. They're keeping a close eye on how Jonathan Allen stewards this franchise moving forward. John got lost in the emotion of it all last season. He's not going to be the last one to do it. Not in any walk of life. Certainly wasn't the first. I'm not even going to stand here and try to pretend to you that I've never gotten lost in the emotions of something. But it's how you come back from that. Making the mistake is one thing. Isolating yourself intentionally or non-intentionally is one thing. How do you come back for it? That's what we're all going to be watching in 2024 because the play on the field is typically pretty solid, typically pretty consistent. This was the kind of anomaly. Not that he's never been frustrated before, but the way that he kind of approached it and exposed it last season was the anomaly. Allen is far from the only guy on the team, though, that needs to show something this coming season. In fact, the guy playing right next to him, defensive tackle Duran Payne, he needs to prove that money didn't kill his motor. That's coming up next on today's episode of Locked On Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Passion, drive, and patience. Those three things help any team, any organization bring home a winning trophy, but it's also what eBay Motors knows keeps your ride or die vehicle alive. And today's episode of Locked On Commanders is brought to you by eBay Motors, who has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and even level it up to peak performance, whether it's superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, whatever you're looking for, whether you're looking for more speed, more power, more style, anything you need for that vehicle, eBay Motors has got you covered with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die. You're always going to find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time where you get your money back because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need and the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car 
into the MVP. And then from there, all you got to do is bring home that win. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions do apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Thanks again for making Locked On Commanders your first listener, first view today and every day. Every day, as always, thank you for coming through on a regular basis like you do. We will have another episode of Locked On Commanders, of course, coming up Monday. But in the meantime, if you need more sports and maybe the biggest sports and the and, and the non-Washington Commander sports all the time, check out Locked On Sports Today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you every single day and free on YouTube or the Amazon Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Next up in our list of players who have something to prove on the Commander's defense, Defensive tackle, Deron Payne, following up Jonathan Allen. Look, I'm a big fan of Deron Payne. He's a chill dude. He's absolutely just about doing his work at the same time. He plays more fiercely than his outward personality would suggest sometimes. Uh, I've actually had people comment. I dropped an interview that we did with with Deron last, or not last week, but the week before during OTAs. Uh, and, and a lot of people said, you know, he looks like he's uncomfortable talking to the media or just doesn't like talking, things like that. I would tell you Deron is just a chill dude, man. That That's not, un, that's not uncomfortable uncomfortable that's not discomfort right let's, let's speak english here that's not discomfort that you're seeing or hearing from duran when he does interviews he's just a chill dude man uh, but again once he gets on the field that fierceness kind of comes out that aggressive kind of that aggression kind of comes out uh but that laid back demeanor paired with lower than expected production early in his career brought questions right we all remember go back to 2021 2022 whether or not he would be re-signed by the washington commanders in after his contract year of 2022 well up until that point, Jerron Payne's laid back demeanor, uh, public demeanor, and the fact that he had five sacks in his rookie season, but didn't have even that number again at all throughout the rest of his rookie deal, uh, combined to create some questions on the future of Jerron Payne. And in his fifth year, his contract year, he exploded 11 and a half sacks uh, for the team, for Jerron Payne. And that led us all to think that, hey, man, he might hit 13 in 2023. Well, just like a lot of people in 2023 associated with this team, he suffered. And it came back down to earth with just four sacks in those 17 games. So now the murmurs are starting to come back. Some of them are just fully back. Some people are just flat out questioning it. Did Deron Payne only get those 11 and a half sacks because he needed to get that paycheck? Um, I think it's a fair question simply because of the history in the NFL and some players that show up during contract years and don't ever show up again until the next contract year, right? So I think it's it's Deron Payne is carrying the weight of a lot of predecessors, right? But I think personally, just, you know, the the little, honestly, that I really know him, um, because as much as we want to claim that being in the locker room and on the practice field makes us know him, uh, we do know them better than most fans, but we don't know them inside and out like some people would suggest. But the little that I do know Deron Payne, I don't think the money is causing any type of comfort. I don't think the money is causing any type of lack of effort. Um, I really do give him a little bit of a pass and say that it was mostly coaching staff related. Um, and there's only one way, though, for Duran to prove me wrong or right, and that's to produce uh, with this new coaching staff. And I don't think Payne needs to hit 11 and a half sacks necessarily, although we would love 11 and a half sacks from Duran Payne, right? But I do think the floor is somewhere around eight. I think Duran Payne, if he wants to completely silence these murmurs from people outside the organization that maybe he's just a paycheck player, uh, he's got to get eight sacks. If Payne doesn't produce to that level, there may be some talks next offseason from non-decision makers, right? People like me, people like fans, uh, about moving him because the Washington Commanders, quite frankly, could save a little bit of money next year if they'd move on from Deron Payne. Not a lot. It's like a million, right? So some people are going to come back and say, bro, that's not near enough to work, uh, to, to warrant moving on from a guy like Deron Payne, even if he's not giving you 11 sacks. And I would tell you, you're absolutely, you know, that that argument would be absolutely rooted in logic. Sure, I could absolutely agree with that. However, I can also tell you, this coaching staff and this general manager, Adam Peters, if they don't view Deron Payne, let's go back to our previous conversation, if they don't view Deron Payne as part of the solution to what they're trying to build, they'll take that million. So like, depending on how far the spectrum, right? So there's a, there's a far end of the spectrum on one side where Deron is just like detrimental to the team, which I don't think we're going to get there. And then there's a far opposite side where it's like, man, we need to lock this dude to a lifetime contract right now. And again, you're not going to get there. So it's going to be somewhere in the middle. The more it is to the, to the bad side, the more possible it is that the team decides to move on from him. And with $100 million in salary cap space, they've got the money to go, ink a big deal, 
with all their draft capital. They got the money to go sign a guy. If Johnny Newton produces once he gets healthy, you know, then obviously that all kind of add on to it. So I'm just saying there is a possibility here where not necessarily inside the organization, but there could be some fans calling for him to be moved, just like there's fans calling for Jonathan Allen to be moved this season. There could be some media who thinks that the team needs to move on from him, just like there's some media who thinks the team needs to move on from John Allen, or at least did think that they needed or should consider moving on from John Allen. So again, not necessarily saying it's something that will happen in 2025, even if Duran doesn't get more than say four sacks this year, but if Duran wants to keep the conversation out of people's mouths in general, then that would be something worthwhile. Speaking of contracts, Jonathan Allen's contract is a different situation. It really kind of puts even more pressure on him uh, to not only be the best kind of representative for his hometown team, but also produce because Washington can save $11 million next year if they move on from his contract. So Deron Payne, Jonathan Allen certainly have some things to prove in different levels uh, for the Washington Commanders this season. Next player is another returning player and an obvious one, linebacker Jamin Davis. Look, Jamin Davis by himself, and again, the degree that you blame the coaching versus you blame the player is going to differ from person to person, and it's certainly fair. I think both sides certainly deserve their own share of that you know, failure pie so far of a first-round pick. So definitely don't put all of it on Jamin. And if you don't put most of it on Jamin, that's fine. But with the arrival of linebackers Bobby Wagner, Frankie Lou, Jamin Davis is now basically being looked at as the third linebacker in the room. And there are some people who think that fifth-round rookie linebacker Jordan McGee might actually overtake him as the third linebacker in in the room by the end of the preseason. However, I don't think I'd go that far yet. I do like Jordan McGee, what we've seen so far, but I don't think I'd go that far. It is clear that the Washington commander staff wants one thing out of Jamin Davis, and that is something completely different than he has ever done in his career so far. Right now, giving him practice reps on the edge is a clear sign of wanting something different out of Jamin Davis. He's going to be playing, in my opinion, in a way, in a position that we've never seen him play before in the NFL. And the thing about Jamin that's really interesting, and again, we kind of talked about this again earlier in the week as well, and some of the comments that Dan Quinn made at the NFL Scouting Combine about looking at Jamin as a blitzer, and we looked at some PFF grades and all that stuff. But here's the thing. Jamin coming out in the NFL draft was just about three quarters of an inch taller than Micah Parsons and about 12 pounds lighter. Parsons' athleticism score at the NFL Scouting Combine was a 78. Jamin Davis is a 94. So there are some clear parallels that can be drawn uh, as far as build and athletic ability, but now there's usage and comes style and comes scheme because while the Washington Commanders have been using Jamin Davis as a very pure linebacker style player, the Dallas Cowboys have basically been using Mike Parsons as an edge player. Now we're seeing Jamin Davis get some edge reps at sack. Parsons is still listed as a Cowboy or as a linebacker on the Cowboys roster. When you look at his snaps, he spent 88% of his time on the line of scrimmage. Most of those as a left defensive end playing opposite of Dorrance Armstrong, who just happens to be in Washington now. So I'm not saying that's going to be a carbon copy, right? Copy paste from Dallas, Micah Parsons, and Jamie Davis. Okay. But I do think that what Dallas did with Micah, you're going to see very similar things in Washington with Jamin. And if Jamin Davis can be proved to be even as close as effective as Micah Parsons can be at times, then he's going to get a new deal from someone in 2025. If I'm advising Jamin, that new deal that comes with the people who helped you get that success in the first place. But players got to make those decisions on their own. Speaking of sticking with what works, Dorrance Armstrong, speaking of him, followed Dan Quinn and Joe Witt Jr. to Washington from Dallas. And he also brought some expectations that he's going to need to live up to coming here to the D.C. area. That's coming up next on today's episode of Locked On Commanders. Wrapping up this defensive look at players with something approved by looking at Dorrance Armstrong coming over from the Dallas Cowboys. One of the new guys that I'm most excited about, he and Frankie Louvu combined are, are both kind of in the same boat as far as I'm concerned, where they both have some expectations here that they could be considered star players on this defense within the next year or two. Now, I'm going to isolate Armstrong here, however, because he's got a little bit more experience with the coaching staff and style. So the expectations for him are obviously going to be a little bit higher. Now, very quietly so far in his NFL career, Dorrance Armstrong or Dorrance Armstrong has had seven and a half sacks, eight and a half sacks, and five sacks in the last three seasons of his career, all while starting just 11 games. When you look at that three season stretch, Armstrong ranks 34th in the entire NFL in sacks. Think about that. Think about the fact that every team has two edge rushers. And then think about how the amount of pass rushing linebackers we see in the NFL today, pass rushing, blitzing safeties that we see in the NFL today. This guy who started less than four games per year on average in the last three seasons is in the top 34 of all of those people. That's not just defensive ends, guys. 
That's every single, I, I even, I even included in my filters, they've included quarterbacks. I literally left every single player in the NFL eligible of all players that suit up in the NFL the last three seasons. Dorrance Armstrong is 34th in sacks and he started 11 games total. He is ahead of Jadavian Clowney. He's ahead of Bradley Chubb, Shaquille Barrett. He had fewer starts than all of them. Not only fewer starts, he played at least 300 fewer snaps than each of those guys during that time frame as well, right? Now, if you want to be a detractor, you say, okay, but he also has DeMarcus Lawrence on the other side. He also has Michael Parson on the other side. And you're right. And that's what I'm talking about. This is the opportunity for Dorrance Armstrong to prove. I'm not just a guy that eats off of other people's plates. I'm a guy that comes in here and eats off my own plate. As edge rushers are concerned, he is statistically been one of the better ones. Turn on the tape. It's very exciting. It's a very fun watch. Insiders, you already know we did a tape study this offseason. Now is his time to shine because there is no DeMarcus Lawrence. There is no Micah Parsons to steal the spotlight, earn the spotlight, whatever you want to call it. Remember, I told you this list isn't by design about being negative, right? So not everybody on this list is just like, I'm just trying to kick them while they're down. This is an instance of that specifically. This is the year for Dorrance Armstrong to confirm what many are already starting to believe here that he could be one of the better pass rushers in the National Football League. He doesn't have to get all the way there this year, but if he can hit nine sacks this season, he'll definitely be on his way. People are definitely going to be very happy with seeing him here. Double digits, and he might start to get some national attention as well. Now, of course, this isn't everybody who has something to prove on the defense, so share your additions to the list in the comments. Insiders, you know what to do. Share your additions to this list with me via text message. Coming up next week, we're going to have a brand new week of Locked On Commanders content for you. We've also got another OTA practice coming up next week, so that's going to be exciting, all leading up to a mini camp, two or three days of mini camp the week following. And then we will hit that dreaded long stretch between the end of mini camp and the beginning of training camp. But we will be here for all of it and every moment of it. In the meantime, if you got questions or comments, throw them down in the YouTube comment section or text me directly by becoming a Locked On Commanders insider. Go to joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Commanders. Don't forget, also check out Locked On Sports Today, the first ever 24-7 live streaming sports channel on YouTube. And as always, thank you for making Locked On Commanders your first listen of the day, every day, every dayers. Thanks for coming through like you do. Until we speak again, if you're out and about, please be safe, be kind, and I'll see you next time for another episode of Locked On Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.